I have no problem. I'll be done by one thirty. I was told to be done by one thirty. Okay, uh, we're going to get started on yet another bright and sunny, cheerful <laughs> winter day in New England. Um, it's with my great pleasure to introduce my long-term colleague and friend, Dr. John DeKesic. He is a distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Health and Physical Activity, as well as the director of the Healthy Lifestyle Institute at the University of Pittsburgh. In these roles, John has been instrumental in transformative initiatives at the regional, national, and international levels. And they emphasize the importance of physical activity as a key lifestyle behavior for enhancing health. Dr. Jakasik's work has resulted in him securing over 40 million in direct external funds. Amazing total. He has authored or co-authored over 220 research manuscripts and book chapters, and he is currently serving as the principal investigator at the Pittsburgh Clinical Center for the Multi-Center Molecular Transducers of Physical Activity Consortium, more affectionately known by the investigative team as MORCAC. Um, and this is the largest investment NIH has made to study pathways by which exercise enhances health. Dr. Chikisik's research also focuses on the interaction between energy expenditure and intake the influence these factors have on body weight regulation and biobehavioral pathways by which physical activity impacts health-related outcomes. Not surprisingly, Dr. Jakisic has served on numerous national and international committees to develop physical activity guidelines for the prevention and treatment of obesity and other chronic health conditions. Indeed, we first worked together when I was chair of the American College of Sports Medicine Pronouncements Committee, and Dr. Jakisic was an author on the college's position stand, which is a scientific statement entitled Appropriate Physical Activity Interventions for Weight Loss and Prevention of Weight Gain for Adults that was published way back in 2009. More recently, we worked together as members of the 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans Advisory Committee. Dr. Jakisic led the subcommittee on cardiometabolic health and weight regain, of which I was a member. I was very impressed with the stringent deadlines imposed upon that group, which we talked about in our meeting today, and how he never seemed stressed and led in a quiet, efficient way. Are you kidding you me? Stress, were Are you? you kidding me? No one ever knew that. <laughs> John is here to celebrate one of my favorite months of the year with us, Heart Health Month. And I must say also, this is my mother's 89th birthday today, wow. um, yeah. which is one reason the month is so special. And he will give to us his talk on contemporary perspectives of physical activity, maximizing the benefits for health and well-being. Thank um, oh, thanks, Linda. Uh, oh, can you hear me OK? Good. Uh, all right, thanks so much, and Amy, thanks for inviting me. It's been how many years we've tried to make this happen, and finally, huh? We, had, we waited for the 89th birthday of Linda's mom to make it all happen, so we figured we'd get it right this time, Linda. So I appreciate you guys all coming out today and giving me a chance to chat. Um, thanks for the great introduction. Um, you know, we go back a number of years working on this. So my talk today is really going to be around my perspectives of where I think the field is, some of uh, the comments I'll have will come from the activity guidelines that Linda mentioned that we worked on um, with some perspectives along, along that to suggest areas where I think we could be doing more work, areas that I think that we're doing some work in that could be intriguing, and where the field kind of generally needs to go from my perspective to try to help advance the space of physical activity around health and, health and well-being. And so, as Linda pointed out, we, you know, we've gone through these iterations of different guidelines, and you know, we could probably put a stream of things up here that kind of show the history and, and timeline of when things have happened. But you know, these, these three publications, I think, were key to moving the world of physical activity. And I'm going to use the word physical activity a lot more than exercise um, today, because I really feel like they are somewhat different in terms of what they're, what they're getting, what we're trying to get at. But you know, these, these um, opportunities have taken us over the last probably 20-ish years, 25 years, to places that you know, we never knew that we could go 
but have really changed and transformed the field of physical activity all the way from the, guide, the, the Surgeon General's first report to the first guidelines and to the more recent guidelines that have come out in 2018. And who knows out here, Linda, whether or not that'll be there and whether we'll be involved in that or not. But we'll see in 2028, I guess, is when that will... I actually thought about this. They're going to be asking for nominations soon for that. <laughs> so it's, um, and yes, I was very stressed during that process, to be honest with you. So, you know, the whole idea, though, around activity and acti activity and exercise is really kind of critically important. Um, and I think that, you know, we now realize that what started off as performance, what started off as kind of work hardening, what started off as something that wasn't really health related has really taken a focus in the area of health. And I think that's where most of the work is being done. But we still have our roots back in very traditional areas of exercise physiology, which I still think are core. So many of the benefits that we see from a health perspective that come from activity, I believe, still have the same principles. So for example, our old-fashioned overload principles, you know, keep, to keep accruing benefits, you've got to keep doing a little bit more. Those kinds of things still sit there. And as, as uh, Linda pointed out, we're involved in this large molecular transducer study to try to understand better what are the things that are happening deep down in the body that will help maybe under, help us understand why activity is good for us and probably more importantly, why activity and the benefits of activity have such variability across individuals. That's critically important. <clears throat> and you know, in our own clinical work, when you have you know, two people sitting next to one another and they're both doing the exact same thing and one's getting more benefit than the other, you know, it, it's not because all the time somebody else is slacking off. Sometimes it's just the way their body's going to respond and we need to know that and we need to understand that why. And, and we were talking earlier today with a couple of folks. I also feel that in understanding this, if we found that the threshold of activity that's necessary to in, induce a change in some health behavior might be 250 minutes a week, that's a lot of behavior to ask someone to do. But if we could find out how we can make 125 minutes work for that person with the right nutritional components or the right supplemental components that go with that, maybe more people can engage and, and accrue the benefits. So we need to understand that it's not just about exercise is everything to everyone because not everybody has the time, the desire, the reward that comes from it, all the other things that we've been talking about this morning. So I think this is critically important for us to understand. So across these domains of, uh, or, or opportunities that we've had, the field has somewhat transformed itself. It's transformed itself from, again, performance-based programming to somewhat rehabilitative um, uh, transformations to now prevention and more public health-related initiatives. So all of those are critically, critically important. And if we look back at some of the initial, you know, work in 1995, the Rust Pate paper that came out, we still talk about it all the time in JAMA, that was an uh, American College of Sports Medicine and CDC combined paper back at that time. It really, you know, not for the first time, but really kind of still is the place where we talk about 30 minutes of activity on most preferably all days of the week is what's helpful to people. And I think that that's critically important around this idea of most preferably all. It talks about how activity becomes a part of your lifestyle. Activity becomes a habit. Activity becomes something that we do. You know, I, I talked earlier today about how I think about activity as like brushing your teeth, right? It's something that you just do and you do it all the time. You do it every day. How do we make activity ingrained in people's lives that same way? But this is the idea behind that guideline. Do something, do it often, and make it part of what you do. Um, and the idea was is that too many people have thought that the 150 minute goal was the goal. When in fact, if you read closely these guidelines, it speaks to 150 might be the threshold where most stuff comes online, but if you do more, you might get more out of it. So it's not the ultimate goal, it's kind of a low threshold that was established at that time. The 2008 guidelines expanded on that a little bit and said somewhere between 150 and 300 minutes might be the target for different things, and that it should be at this moderate intensity. So get up, move, move with, the, move with vigor, move with a purpose, those kind of things. And I like to describe modern intensity activity as walking fast enough as if you were going to be late for a meeting unless you hurried up, right? A lot of people talk about it as singing, and some people we don't ever want to hear sing, so we, don't want, we want them to go harder. But thinking about it from that perspective, everybody has been in a hurry at some point. And I also think about, you know, what's vigorous activity? What is the threshold that we really don't tell people that they have to go to? 
You know, if you're on campus here and the bus is pulling away from the bus stop and you're chasing it, that's vigorous. We don't need that. So don't chase the bus. Just walk so you're not going to be late to the meeting, right? And if we talked about that from that perspective to people, they know what that feels like. They know what that is. And I think that's important for us to couch that intensity. But I think that we've been stuck now in this moderate to vigorous intensity mode now for some time. And I'm going to have some comments today that I think are going to help, at least from my perspective, help me to couch how to think about moving forward in terms of this intensity factor, which I think can be critically important. So in 2018, we actually came forward and we really didn't change the dose, right, Lynn? We didn't change the dose all that much. We really said, you know, here's, here's still that window where we think that everything is really kind of a good, a good place to be. Um, and you can get more out of it. But there were some small intricacies that came out of that guideline, which is where I think the field is now starting to think differently about activity once again. The challenge has been, <laughs> is that while we think about it differently, how strong is the evidence in some of that space that we can actually say, we know for sure that it's that way? And I'll give you a few comments around where I think we have some evidence, but we need more evidence in order to kind of really move, move the field forward in a meaningful way. I am not gonna read all of these, and nor is my talk about all of these. But I think at this point in time, we have established that physical activity of a sufficient dose and threshold has benefits in so, so many ways. It cuts across you know, all age groups, all the way from very, very young children, all the way to the oldest of the old. It cuts across women, it cuts across men, it cuts across you know, race, ethnicity groups, and it cuts, cuts across so many other conditions that we have. And I think what's been interesting very, in a very big way for us in the 18 guidelines was that a few new, new things came on board. It's not that we didn't know about them, but the evidence has now become substantial enough that we actually can say some things positively about that. Some of those areas that you know, weren't talked about before but now are talked about, dementia, cognition, brain health, these kind of things are critically important as we go forward. We're now starting to look beyond just traditional resistance training and cardio training to things like Tai Chi and yoga and other kinds of alternative forms of activity and thinking about it in a much broader perspective. So there's still work to be done in terms of where we are, but I think, that, I think that there is probably a good degree of consensus that for most conditions, a person who's more physically active probably has, is better, it's better off than a person who's not very active. And I think that that's across multiple body systems, multiple domains, and we can argue about is it in every area, but I think the consensus is you're better off to be active than not. The question is, is how can we get individuals to become more active and what are the thresholds we need people to be at to get those benefits and are there more finite intricacies that we need to be considering when we start to think about recommending activity to people. So all, I am not going to read these, but I've highlighted some things in green that come right out of not the advisory report, but the guidelines that came from the federal government. And understand, this is important, that the guidelines, that there's an advisory group who, who summarizes the evidence. But that advisory group, myself, Linda, and others, didn't write the guidelines. So don't blame us for what's in the guidelines. <laughs> right, Linda? We did not write the guidelines. Indi individuals from the federal government take that report and they write the guidelines based upon their interpretation of what that evidence says. Okay. And what's important here is that in pre-age school children, just look at what it talks about. It talks about activity, growth, development, encourage play, encourage types. It doesn't say put these kids on a treadmill for 30 minutes, five days a week. It doesn't say that. You start to move up to children and adolescents, it talks about enjoyment. It talks about age appropriateness. Again, it doesn't say, put them on a treadmill five days a week for 30 minutes. Nowhere does it say that. You start to get into children and adolescents, the evidence starts to kind of broaden itself a little bit. It speaks about aerobic, it speaks about muscle, it speaks about bone. And for those who follow the literature, you all under, you, you would understand that not all activity, not all activity will change aerobic capacity. Not all kinds of activity will change muscle strength. Not all kinds of activity will change bone health. 
that may be very unique types of activity or doses of activity or intensity, right? For adults, you know, move more, sit less throughout the day. That's been key now in terms of sit less, move more. That's, 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 it's, it's important that we're doing both of those things. We talk about aerobic, we talk about muscle strength training. There's a lot of things in this that we can look at, but it's not, it's not you know, 30 minutes again on a treadmill. It doesn't say that. You start to get into older adults, and it talks about multi-component activities. It speaks to balance training. It speaks to aerobic. It speaks to strength training. And I wanna, I'm pointing this out to you because you know, too many times I think we go, okay, what's the prescription from an exercise physiology perspective? But then you read public health guidelines, and it doesn't talk about it quite like that. It doesn't speak to it that way. <clears throat> and so I think we have to be careful about how we interpret what we think from a science base to how it interprets out to the public. What's forward facing? There's issues around uh, activity around pregnancy, about aerobic. It speaks to, again, make this habitual, make sure that this is appropriate for, for that uh, expecting mom and so on. And, it, and there's also individuals with chronic disabilities. Now, what are those? What are those individuals? What are the benefits? Again, it speaks to a variety of things highlighted in green that we should be focusing on. So, what I point out, the reason I go through those quickly, and all you have to do is pick out the guidelines report, the executive report, and it talks about all those, is nowhere in the guidelines does it say this form of physical activity is the form of physical activity that is the absolute 100% best form of physical activity for every person. It doesn't say that. And I bring this up because I think the field, the field of physical activity and exercise physiology in particular, and you, all you have to do is watch television and watch the infomercials. This is the best exercise that gives you the best benefit. That's what it says all the time. And we have infighting amongst, is it better to have people do resistance training or cardio training? Is it better to have them do this or that? What's the absolute best? And I, and I raise this because you look at the guidelines and if you look at what it says, it tells me that I need people to do a variety of things. That there is not one perfect mode of activity that people should be doing. And I don't think we're ever gonna find the perfect mode of activity that people should do to accrue health benefits. Get them to do things that are gonna increase muscle strength and endurance. Get them to do things that are gonna increase their cardiorespiratory capacity. Get them to do things that are going to increase their muscular strength and or, or bone health. Get them to do things that are gonna help with their balance. Get them to do things that might actually stimulate their brain to function differently to get cognitive benefits from that. All the, and that is not all the same kind of activity. So I think to move the field forward, we need to stop focusing on what's the perfect form of activity, but what's maybe the better combination of these activities that are going to encompass us to in, in, incorporate most of those health benefits that we talked about. And I think that's the kind of work that we need to be doing is multimodal activity interventions, not single modal activity interventions. So for example, in Motor Pack, we have a, stu we have a study where we're doing one group getting cardio, one group's getting resistance. But if you read the guidelines, wouldn't you suggest that maybe we should have a group that's getting cardio and resistance training? Because that's what the guidelines say is where the benefits are coming from. But we don't have that group, but maybe we should. And they may not be the same transducers, they may not be the same molecular responses. So I think we need to move forward in terms of understanding this in a little different way than we've been looking at it um, from this perspective. So what about minutes and how did we land on what the minutes are? We, you know, We've gone back and forth around, is, is, this, is this supposed to be met minutes per week, met, met hours per week, all these things. And the reality is the public look, looks and goes, how many minutes do I need to do this? And what's the least amount I can get away with? Right? What's the least I can do and accrue health benefits, right, or performance benefits? And so we've looked at, we looked at a lot of curves. Um, these are just some of, the, some of those that, are, that came out of the report. Um, but I think it's important to pay attention to some of these things. This is um, hazard rate of mortality, all-cause mortality. This is met hours per week. Um, so the more the, high, the, the, more, the, the, the more you do, the, the higher this number will go. And what's really interesting uh, as we looked at this is this is the sweet spot right in here. This is that 150 to 300 range, okay? And you can see that most of the benefit across this spectrum occurs right in here, and that's why we were talking about that. 70 plus percent will occur here. 
But what's very, very interesting is that the slope of the line is the steepest right here. And then from a public health perspective, yes, it's important to take people who are kind of somewhat active to more active. But maybe the biggest bang, public health-wise, is to at least take those who are very low active and get them to do something. Because you're going to move this steep line down dramatically. And I think that that's a very different animal. You know, we were talking earlier today about, you know, this, the great recreation center you guys now have on campus. And at our university, we're going through the planning of a build for a brand new recreation center as well. It's going to be built in three years. And the whole debate is, who's this for? In addition to the students and the faculty and the staff. But who's this for? Is this to take those individuals who already go to 24-hour fitness, you know, LA fitness, planet fitness, and just give them a different place to come? So they have a nicer space? Or is this to actually find a way to get individuals who are not doing anything and give them a comfort space that they can come to and get those people who are way down here more active? Those are philosophically important questions, right? And if, if not that your chancellor is going to ask me, your provost will ask me, but I would say, you're gonna get more return on your dollar if you can get these people engaged than to take people who are already here and just give them a different venue. But that's just my own personal opinion. But it's philosophically important to understand that. This is another one that we see a similar kind of thing with all-cause mortality, just another way of looking at it. Um, this is one, one to two times the minimum recommendation. Look at the big slope here. Look at this. Two to three times. But this is the sweet spot right in here. Getting, look at the slope of this line, how steep it is right at the beginning. How do we engage? And, saying, and talking to someone about physical activity, and saying, so, all right, you're not doing anything right now, so what we're going to do is have you come to the gym five days a week, and we're going to give you these 10 exercises on resistance training, and you're going to take a, a spin class, and then you're also going to run on the treadmill cut. That is not going to move those people downward. All right, how do we get those people doing something so over the course of time they move across the spectrum of activity? I think is important. Along that line, this is really important, I think, this is basically, here's your, here's your curve, your relative risk curve. But these bars here are the percentage of adults engaging in that amount of activity. I don't know why it's flipping, but I'm not touching that button. I swear I'm not. <laughs> I'm not touching that button. Um, why, you know, there's, this, is, this is great. Look at, how, look at the benefit here. But this isn't where all the people are. Look how many people are up here. Look how many, what percentage of the people are in these very low categories that we can address? Those are the people that we need to target. How do we get to them? Maybe it's through a new rec center, maybe it's not. And we have, we have to think about that. And then of course these mortality curves and years of life gain. This is, this is important to see, you know, boy, four years of life gain over the course of time, here's the mortality curves. It moves the needle, folks, activity is important. So how do we get to this? How do we think about this in a way that, why is this important? Well, this is where that 150 to 300 minutes comes from. And that's why we landed on that. But you have to read the guidelines closely and the advisory report closely. Because while that's a recommended zone, it also says benefits can be accrued even at lower thresholds of physical activity. It may not be all the benefits, but it's going to be some of those benefits. And it's on the pathway to those bigger benefits. So one of the things that I found interesting in the guidelines report, um, and as we worked on it, was maybe the threshold's different for the different things we want. And so when we looked at it, this was a neat figure that we put in. And what this shows you is, I swear I didn't touch that. I am not touching that. I swear I'm not touching that. OK. Um, these are all the, these are just five different health conditions. And look at the difference in these curves. Some of them have very steep reductions at the beginning that kind of flatten out. Some of these are much more gradual over the course of time, right? Over the course of the, of the dose. And that, you know, boy, this is really kind of interesting to think about. So when you're looking at things like breast cancer and colon cancers, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, Here's diabetes, it kind of drops, keeps going, and then it flattens out. And then you look at ischemic stroke. Look at that big drop at the beginning when you go from like very low to somewhere higher. 
So it's really important to understand that you know, the thresholds are not exactly the same for every benefit that you might accrue. And we saw the same thing around these different incidence rates of different, different things. So here you see incidence of developing uh, obesity. So individuals were not classified with obesity and then became classified with obesity over time. And we looked at these hours a week and this is a vigorous activity, so if you wanted to go from vigorous to moderate, you probably have to double the hours, probably, some, 25 to 50% more, or, or double the hours. So here, you can see there's this nice, almost threshold effect coming across. I don't want to say that it's completely dose response, but it sure has that look to it, doesn't it, at least from that, that perspective. And you can see that, boy, it takes a lot of activity, potentially, to prevent obesity now, for a variety of reasons. Obesity is caused by so many factors other than just food consumption and what causes food consumption, right? So we have a lot of other factors. We have to overcome the sitting. We have to have sleep gets into the mix. Stress gets into the mix. All kinds of stuff comes in. And that may be why these thresholds might need to be high at this point in time. When you take a look, and this is one of the studies, um, I think, Linda, that you put in, um, in, in your part of the chapter, where we, talk, we looked at um, re inverse relationship between insulin and hypertension in people with normal blood pressure, which may be very different than people who already have hypertension and trying to reverse it, right? So if you already have it and you're trying to reverse it, that might be a different threshold than if you're trying to prevent it to begin with. And you, in this case, this is one of those studies that showed this really kind of nice, almost linear line, right? And I remember this one being added. Um, and so this was great because it came out in 17 and then we finished this at the end of 17. But I think it was a, like almost a late ad at the end. But it was nice to see this. That, that is, again, different than what we see for obesity. And then you start to take a look at these types of things in terms of relative risk of type 2 diabetes. And these are somewhat consistent, but you know, the, these thresholds, if you were to match all these up on one on the same axis, the threshold by which you start to see these benefits might be different. So I just kind of took all this and threw it up on a slide that I, I really hoped that this was going to make it into the guidelines, and it didn't. But I like it because I made it. But this was just me. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure it's completely accurate. So just, just, you know, it wasn't vetted by the peer review group. So I just kind of grabbed stuff out of the chapters and threw it together. But um, you know, it, going from light green to dark green, this is some benefit, more benefit. The darker the green, the more the benefit. Um, and so what I tried to do here was this is minutes a week of moderate to vigorous. And I tried to convert those met hours per week, minute, minute, you know, met minutes per week, whatever they were, into some kind of reasonable, same kind of um, uh, scope. And what you see is that some of the cardiovascular and all-cause mortality benefits onboard pretty early. They onboard pretty early in the minutes. And then you start to get into reducing risk of type 2 diabetes. And that stuff to on, seems to onboard a little bit later. It's coming in at around 75 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And then you get out here, and there's other stuff accruing throughout this, but then you get out here into prevention of obesity. And you're looking at probably the sweet spot being around 200 plus minutes a week to prevent obesity. You're looking at maintenance of weight, uh, weight maintenance of a healthy weight. So you're not gaining weight, right? You're already a healthy weight and you're not gaining any more weight. Um, and that's sort of around the 200 to 225 minute mark. We also know that um, prevention of weight gain is somewhere in this 200 to 300 minute zone. And then we, we looked at some of the data from the hypertension, and I'm not sure this is completely right on, Linda, you could correct me if it's wrong, but it's out there. It's not a low threshold. It's not like happening here. The, the prevention of hypertension is kind of at the high, a little bit higher end of the spectrum as well. I think, I think that was what the, the chapter suggested and the later data suggested. So you can think about this across the spectrum, and how cool would it be for us to take something that looks like this and sit down with a patient and have a physician sit down with a patient and so, so, so here's where these different things happen. Look at all the benefits, but look where they all come on board. And I think this onboarding is really important for us to understand um, and gives us a visual of how it's not one size fits all for every individual. And there's probably individual intra-individual, intra intra and inter-individual variability going on in this as well. What about steps? Everybody has a something on them that's counting right now, telling you how many steps you did or didn't go and do, and it tells you when you made this goal and everything lights up and says how wonderful you are, okay? What about steps, right? Well, you know, there's been this association between steps and selective health outcomes, not all health outcomes, just some health outcomes. It's been interesting. Um, there's all this technology now. Boy, can't we leverage this in a way that really helps people? Um, 
And we wanted to, we felt like it was important to understand this. Like, where are we with this right now? Where, you know, we kind of know where that guideline came from of maybe 10,000 steps a day. But, you know, where are we? And is it really related to the health outcomes that we believe it's related to? And how much do we know about this? So, this was important. There were no studies available when we did the guidelines that spoke to all cause or cardiovascular mortality and step counts. No studies that looked at that. Probably because when we were quantifying physical activity in those studies, we weren't counting steps, we were counting something else. So the best we could probably do is convert those times to what we think are step equivalents, but that's not fair because we really don't know if those, that, that would be a perfect conversion. So we really had no grade assigned. We had insufficient <coughs> evidence. We're only now starting to accumulate data on steps and all-cause mortality and things. So we don't know. Is the threshold 10,000 steps a day? Is it 6,000 steps a day? What is it when it comes to all-cause mortality? We don't know that. What about some diseases? This is a study that was done um, by Bill Krause's group and Kim Huffman and others. So they put this together. And what they looked at here was, um, I think this was the Navigator study, where they basically took this. This is change in ambulatory activity by steps per day. And this is a zero point, so no change over time. And this is five-year um, event rate. And this is cardiovascular events in individuals with impaired glucose tolerance. And so if it goes this way over time, their steps were decreasing. And if it goes that way, their steps were actually increasing per day. And you can see very nicely that when you went from this, min this kind of neutral and you increased your steps over time, your cardiovascular events were going down. When you went that way and you were decreasing your steps, your cardiovascular events were going up. Now, were the steps going down because you were becoming more sickly and the steps were just an outgrowth of maybe something else happening? Or was it a cause and effect? We don't, you know, we don't know that from these kinds of studies. But it suggests that maybe steps are an indicator. But this still didn't tell us the minimum threshold that might be important. It just said, if I increase by 2,000 steps a day, my risk is going down. But what's my baseline? Is my baseline 4,000 steps a day or is my baseline 6,000 steps a day? <coughs> that matters. We need to understand that. And this is metabolic syndrome and a similar kind of thing. Uh, this came out of a the similar study, um, Navigator. And what you just basically see is this is um, independent of the behavior score that the more steps you took on a pedometer, the more likely it was that you were going to have a lower um, metabolic syndrome. So the, the hard outcomes that you know that you've had cardiovascular or all-cause mortality. We don't have the data quite clear on that yet. But across a variety of these kind of at least cardiometabolic outcomes, we're starting to see more and more that steps, more steps are better for you. OK. But where do we have to go with the space? Where does our research need to be? Our research needs to be in a couple of spaces as far as I'm concerned, OK? One, we need prospective studies of steps. We're starting to get those. You know, we have, we have studies now that are just having, everybody's monitoring these things. You can have all these devices and collect this stuff over time, okay? But what about the intensity of the step? I can take 10,000 steps and kind of crawl, or I can take 10,000 steps and kind of move quickly. What about the, does the intensity of this step matter, or is it just that I've taken the step? And I think this is an important piece of work. And how much of that has to be at a higher threshold? How much of it has to be at a lower threshold, right? Think about your day. Most of your steps are not, not moderate to vigorous. You really think about it. Most of your steps are not moderate to vigorous. But they've got to be contributing to something. Is that OK? How much of that is? So this is just a study that we, we published a, um, a while back now, five years, six years now ago. But uh, just to give you an example of how we've been thinking about steps. Um, and that is, this is a weight loss study where we, this is a secondary analysis, so we'll you know, disclose that right away. These are just weight loss curves. And what we did basically was we grouped people into how much weight they lost at six months and how much weight they then subsequently had lost at 18. So the way to describe this is, if you look at this maintain group right here, we used 10% weight loss as the threshold. And if they achieved a 10% weight loss at month six, and we continue to have a 10% weight loss at month 18, they were in considered the maintained group. The non-maintained group lost 10% of their weight by six months, but had regained above 10%. So they were no longer beyond 10% weight loss by 18. The late loss is a group that didn't lose 10% by six, but continued to lose weight and by 18 made it to 10%. 
And the non-loss at both time points did not lose 10% of their weight. And this is just the weight loss curves, just to give you a sense. Suggest to me, Amy, that boy, if we can do this, this is pretty darn good, right? This is, these are our people right here. We gotta figure these people out. So what did our steps look like? We objectively monitored steps across, uh, across different time points of the study. I'm just presenting to you the steps at 18 months. We've looked at this across other, other time points, just for sake of ease today. So if you look at this and you say, okay, the group I'm, I think is the best group is the maintained group. So what did their steps look like? They were at about 10,000 steps a day. The, non, the, the late loss group by the end was at about 9,500, 10,000 steps a day. So they were, they were that threshold of 10,000, like, hey, that's the number, maybe that's our number. Um, you start to look at the, the non-maintained groups, they lost and then regained, they were down around 8,000 steps, and the group that never really lost any kind of significant weight was about 8,000 steps as well. So you say, oh, well, just look at that, and maybe it's 10,000 steps. It's 2,000 steps more than the other groups, and maybe that would be the ticket. So then we went in and looked at the intensity of those steps. The device we were using allowed us to know was that a, a, a light intensity step, a moderate, or a vigorous intensity step. We grouped moderate to vigorous together. So these are the non-moderate to vigorous steps per day. The non-moderate to vigorous steps per day. And what we found was is that they were all at about 4,000 non-moderate to vigorous steps per day. So that was not where the action was. We then looked at whether or not how many steps they got that were not bouted for moderate to vigorous. And by bouted, we were looking at the 10 minute threshold. Was the bout lasting 10 minutes or not? And if not, then we took all those steps that didn't make it to a 10 minute continuous threshold grouped all those steps together. No difference between the non-moderate to vigorous, non-bouted step. The moderate to vigorous, non-bouted steps. In this study, what we found was where they separated was in the bouted steps, moderate to vigorous. That it was 10 minutes or more at a moderate to vigorous intensity. Now this is cr like prospective, retrospective, you know, it's, it's not a randomized study. But it suggests to us that maybe the steps matter. That if I took a person, which we don't know, if I took a person and just got them 10,000 steps a day at light intensity, would that be enough to help them lose and maintain their weight? That's just weight that we're talking about. This picture may be completely different for diabetes, hypertension, you know, all the other factors. But it's an example of how we need to maybe conceptually think about it. We need to think about that pattern of the intensity of the steps, not just the steps themselves. What about the bout length? And this is a somewhat contentious area, I would say, when we, when we got to it in our guidelines discussions. How long does the activity have to be for it to actually impact health? And so this goes back again a little bit where we started to look at where the guidelines came from. And back in 1995, Dr. Pate and his group suggested this 30 minutes. But if you read that 95 paper, What's embedded in one paragraph, it speaks to that this, this 30 minutes is important, but you could accrue that in eight to 10 minute bouts over the course of the day. So three 10 minute bouts would make 30 minutes, and that would be, you know, would give you benefit just like 30 minutes of continuous, right? And there's a literature now, you know, kind of around that. And so after that, in 2008, the Episodes of 10 minutes made it into the guidelines report. So we've been kind of sitting on this 10 minute, and you know, my career kind of started with this 10 minute bout stuff. So I'm a little bit kind of, you gotta prove me wrong now, because that's what I thought about back then. So I've been thinking about this a lot. So we went in the literature and looked at different studies, and I know this looks like a rainbow of some type. But what we looked for were all these different studies, across, well studies across different domains, of outcome. And then we found that, you know, when it's yellow, that means that when, when we found the study, bouts of 10 minutes or longer were had a greater effect than bouts less than 10 minutes. If you see the ones that are less than 10 minutes red, that one suggested that maybe the lower than 10 minute bouts had an effect um, in, the, in those outcomes. No difference meant that when they did direct comparison between greater than or less than 10 minute bouts, they kind of got the same outcome, whether it be no, no benefit or the same benefit. And then these pink ones I just highlight because these are really short periods of activity where you have these kind of get up and move around for 30 second kinds of stuff. And what's interesting is that there's no, no right pattern here. There's nothing that says, you know, 
you know, it's always yellow, always red, always blue, or always pink. But what we concluded from this was that there was at least enough evidence to suggest that across at least some of the domains, that bouts less than 10 minutes would have health benefits, right? And so if you look at the red, those are these things right here. There's a lot of them. It's interesting that some of them are in body fat, some blood pressure, and these cardiometabolic factors. But what's really important is we only found two prospective studies. Everything else was cross-sectional. Everything else was cross-sectional. And we have to be very cautious about basing a full guideline on cross-sectional data. Right? So we have to be very careful about that. So I've been interested in this for a long time. And so when I went, we've been looking at some of this. And so even though these studies don't make it into the, to the guidelines for other reasons, I went back to some of our papers and said, you know, where have we thought about this? So one of the places we thought about this was a paper we published in 2015. This was a study of young adults, 18 to 35 years of age. It was a weight loss study that we had um, behavioral change, diet, but everybody got the same intervention. And we looked at predictors of success, weight loss, at six months. This was, an eight, this was a 24 month trial. This was the paper where at six months that we looked at this. And what was interesting to me was that we put in, and I'll come back to this in a little bit, these, the percentage of um, sedentary time, light intensity time, moderate um, intensity, regardless of bout length, and moderate intensity greater than 10 minutes. And we ran this model, and there was a bunch of other factors in here, as you can see, and we ran this model. And what we found was that the 10 minutes or greater, at least for weight management, was predictive. When we looked at the model that had just total physical activity, moderate vigorous in it, no matter how long that bout length was, it didn't predict. So there was something about the 10-minute bouts, again, that matter, maybe mattered. Whether or not that's about the 10 minutes or not, we don't know. But what it could be, hypothetically speaking, would be maybe there are physiological changes that occur when you can get to a 10-minute bout that are different than what you do get when you do one-minute bouts that add on to one another, that may be impacting body weight regulation, maybe fat metabolism, maybe something, glucose control, who knows, right? We don't know. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe you need these longer bouts of activity to elicit some of the dietary eating behavior changes where we see in some studies exercise has acute effects on dietary intake and causes some people to eat less. It affects hunger and satiety signals. Maybe the bout has to be 10 minutes or longer to have that effect. We don't know. But at least from a weight management perspective, I wouldn't recommend get, every, you know, get a whole bunch of steps. They don't have to be moderate. And it doesn't matter if they're 10 minutes or longer. If anything, I think our data suggests that they probably need, some of them at least have to be moderate to vigorous. Some of them have to be longer than 10 minutes. And I think our data, if I were to put up all the data here, what we find is that for weight management, about 10,000 steps a day is important. 35% of those have to be moderate to vigorous that are in bouts of 10 minutes or more per day. The rest of it can come however you want it. And that's what our data at least looks like in our kind of retrospective look at our stuff. But we need to now do studies to test that stuff. So we need to understand patterns better than we know right now. And at least this is my, like my crown jewel study, that's still my dissertation, but it suggested that adherence, and, adherence goes up in individuals who are sedentary more when you give them short bouts of activity to do as opposed to continuous bouts of activity to do at least initially. Yellow is always higher than blue. And yellow is always higher than red. Red is the prescription per week. This is a study where we said do three or four bouts of 10 minutes a day. When we started at two 10 minute bouts, three 10 minute bouts, and then four 10 minute bouts a day over a 20 week study. And we compared that to one 20 minute bout, one 30 minute, or 130 20 minute bout a day, one 30 minute bout a day, one 40 minute bout a day. And we found that you know in this study, telling people get at least 10 minutes at a time, they got more days per week where they got at least 10 minutes. Continuous. Also, even if they couldn't get all three or four bouts, they may have gotten 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at lunch, the day fell apart, but at least they got 20 minutes. Versus if you say, give me 30 or 40 minutes and you can't find that block, you're not going to do anything. So it helps to kind of change how we think about prescribing activity for people. So we just did this, and this is going to be presented at the ACSM meeting. 
um, we went into one of our studies at the beginning where we, we recruit individuals who self-report, self-report not exercising for 60 minutes or more per week at a moderate to vigorous intensity. So they're not doing structured, purposeful activity. Because our studies are about weight management and trying to get people to get to those levels of activity. And we went back to our activity monitor data, and we said, how active would these people be if we looked at the bouts as one minute bouts or 10 minute bouts? How active would they be? What would it look like? What's interesting was, is the median score showed that if we looked at any bout one minute or longer, they would be, their median activity was 244 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per week. Yet they're reporting no purposeful exercise greater than 60 minutes. If we do that and change that and use the 10 minute bout, that drops way down to 103 minutes a week. Big difference in terms of what we're thinking our baseline is for these people, right? Correlation with, I don't know why that's doing that, but correlation with BMI, 0.327 <coughs> and 0.75, negative. So the more they did, the lower the body, the BMI. That makes sense. They're more active, BMI would be lower. And it's about equally predictive on both, both extremes. At baseline, this is baseline. We haven't done anything in the intervention. Over here, this is interesting. If we were to then classify people as, who's meeting the physical activity guidelines? What percentage of the people are meeting the physical activity guidelines based upon these objectively measured data? If we use the one minute bounce, we would say, boy, I don't even know why we're focusing on physical activity in this study, because 68% of the people are meeting the guidelines. Versus if we use the 10-minute bout, that drops down to 40%. And that's probably not purposeful exercise. It's, I had to walk from here to another place on campus, so I had to walk to get there. But it's not purposeful exercise. I bring this up because this impacts how we start thinking about how active people are and whether or not they're meeting the guidelines or not. And I think we have to be careful. We just have to be careful about saying, boy, these people are all active enough. Meanwhile, their average BMI in this study is 33. Their blood pressure is, on average, about 130 over you know, high 80s. Their lipid levels are well above the thresholds. These people are not active enough to be you know, really healthy. But if you look at this, we'd say, hey, leave their activity alone, they're healthy. So let's be care I think we have to be careful. And I think we need more work to actually define this minute stuff before we kind of accept that as the truth. If there's some limitations um, because of the cross-sectional nature of some of the data. So I'll end with a couple additional thoughts around some of this sitting standing stuff. I know we talked about that this morning. It's kind of interesting for us. We've been in this space now for some, some time working on this and a lot of people are, are in this space because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And we've talked about this, uh, the benefits of sitting versus standing. We kind of couch one against the other. I actually think that it's really is it really sitting and standing, or is it really standing slash moving and sitting? Those are different. Those are very different. And I think that the evidence might show to be different if we separate those two. So you know, these are the studies that came out that showed, you know, even in people who are very active, if they're too sedentary, they're blunting the effect of that activity. And even if people aren't very active, as long as they're not sitting a lot, there's health benefits that go with that. So stand more, sit less, clearly. Even if you're active, stand more and sit less, okay? So we can target that, that's important. But what these studies don't tell us is when they're not sitting and they're standing, does that mean they're moving or they're just standing? Am I doing this or am I doing this? These are two very different behaviors and probably have two very different outcomes. And when you look at one, uh, one of the studies that was done, this was published a few years ago now, it's interesting to me, um, Genevieve Healy uh, and her colleagues published this. But they looked across a variety of outcomes and they looked at the relative risk and they took um, sit to stand um, as kind of the reference. Uh, it, it actually had sit to sit as the reference and they looked at sit to stand and said if I took somebody from sitting to standing, what would happen to that risk? If I took somebody from sitting to moving, stepping around, <coughs> if I took them from standing to moving, what would happen? So at least from a BMI perspective, it looks like sitting to standing is not gonna have a big impact on BMI. But sitting to moving, or standing to moving is where the impact is. 
But then you start to look at other, and here's this waist circumference, that makes sense to me. You start to look at fasting glucose, you know, this didn't seem to make, make much difference. You come down here though to triglycerides, and you see that standing, and um, standing actually has a nice effect. And so I don't want to overinterpret this, but it might be, again, just like activity, whether or not you need to stand or whether or not you need to move might be, have differential effects depending on the outcome that you're interested in. All right? So simply just telling the population, all you need to do is stand more without couching that with, and when possible, turn that standing into moving. Those are very different <coughs> messages. And if you recall, at least the Canadians or the, one, and the Australians came out with the idea of sit less, move more. Their message isn't sit less, stand more. It's sit less, move more. And that's important, right? That's important. <coughs> we do know that there are some independent effects of standing beyond sitting. But whether or not they all were there, it's, it's hard to judge that. And at least from an energy expenditure perspective, you know, we did some of the early studies here. You know, standing doesn't give you that much more energy expenditure than sitting. A little bit, maybe eight calories a, uh, an hour, depends. <coughs> The real benefit is moving around. So, but if you stand, it's kind of hard to stand still, like the guard at Buckingham Palace, right? So you're tending to move, so maybe the first step is getting people to stand and then they're gonna move, right? Um, but again, how predictive is this? We looked at the data, going back to that same study, I said I'd come back to it, where we looked at the 10 minute versus the non 10 minute bounce. Here we put um, sedentary into the mix, light intensity into the mix, and then this moderate to vigorous. On this side, not much came out. Over here, light intensity was more predictive than sedentary. And maybe this is just because if you're not sitting, you're probably doing something light, and so it's kind of overwhelming this. And so we have to make sure, you know, this is the way we did the analysis. We have to go back and look at this. But maybe this idea of light is important because it's just not the, completely the reciprocal, but it says stand up, move around, and when possible, move with a moderate to vigorous intensity for 10 minutes or longer whenever you can. That message could resonate. And I really like this because this speaks to this idea of sedentary and active. And this is, you know, all cause mortality. But you want to, if you're in red, that's bad. If you're in green, that's really good. This suggests that if we took individuals who were sitting a lot and completely <coughs> reduced their sitting but did not increase their moderate to vigorous physical activity. That it goes from a dark shade of red to a less dark shade of red, but it still stays red. Doesn't completely alleviate all the health problems. But if we can then move them across the spectrum of moderate to vigorous, and couple that less sitting with more movement, that's gonna turn it green, and that's what's important. This picture says a thousand words, and I think it's really important. And I'm not saying not to tell people not to sit less, but what, when they're not sitting, what should they be doing? What's that message? We need to understand that message and get it right. So I'll end with these couple thoughts. I think this is important, what I have here. This is just hypothetical data from acti actigraphy, accelerometry. These are three individuals. All three of them have the same amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity at three, three mets would be that. All of them have 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. This down here has one 30 minute bout and three and 31 one minute bouts. So 60 minutes, 30 minutes combined, and then 31 minute bouts. <coughs> this person here has three 10 minute bouts and then 31 minute bouts. This person simply has 60 one minute bouts. All the same amount of activity, all different patterns. The patterning matters, potentially. It might matter how people pattern their activity that's important. And that patterning doesn't just get to bout length, <coughs> an intensity line, it might also get to when do they do it? Do they do it in the morning, the middle of the day, or the evening? Paper came out by Seth Creasy and uh, Eric Willis last year that spoke to, from a weight loss perspective, people that actually accumulated 50% or more of their moderate to vigorous physical activity before noon were better in those project, in those, in those results than people who got activity other times of the day. Again, retrospective analysis, but it's the timing of when you do things important. So we have work to do in this space. We have to understand the spectrum. We have to understand stationary, sedentary, light, moderate, vigorous, sleep. All this matters. It all interfaces with one another. You know, we need to understand how these bouts are accumulated one minute, five minute, ten minute, longer. 
what time of day are they being done? Are they done on the weekdays or the weekend? And does the temporal pattern change for people? By that I mean, if we look at this, and we look at these things independently, you know, if we look at sleep but don't take these other things into account in the right way, we are probably losing the effect of sleep. We need to look at all of these, but we need to intertwine them because they all encompass our 24-hour day. Right? We have to understand that, and we have to understand does the pattern that we see here, and if it changes over time, the pattern that we see here, does that change in the temporal pattern, not just the change in the total volume, matter? when it comes to certain health outcomes. So if it was me, and it is me, the work that we're going towards is trying to understand the 24-hour spectrum, the timing of the day, and the change in the temporal pattern around a variety of health outcomes that we're very interested in that include cardiovascular, cardiometabolic kinds of stuff, obesity, some cancer-related markers, diabetes, those kinds of things. And also now in the area of brain health, cognition, especially in older adults. All this seems to me very important. And so as we think about where we're going and our training opportunities here for not only you know, research, but training opportunities, I think for educational purposes, and this is what we're doing in our academic program, is we're thinking about our educational opportunities as programming opportunities, evaluation research, and evidence-based practice that circle around each other. And I think that as I've talked to some of the faculty here this morning, that's very much where this faculty is going with their, with their work as well, which I applaud. I think it's great. And intertwine into that molecular differences across people. The physiological differences across people are critically important as well. So with that, I'll end. And we have a few minutes for questions if we want them. But I really appreciate you all having me come up. I really enjoyed it. Um, if you want to see some of the neat things that we're doing, you can follow us. Of course, this means now we exist because now we have a Twitter handle, we have a Facebook account, and um, I was told that now we really made it because we have Instagram. So, um, uh, so I don't, I don't know, but uh, somebody else handles this all for us. But follow what we're doing. We have some interesting things that we're doing there, and I appreciate any questions if you have any. If not, I really appreciate you having me here. So, thank you for your time. Any questions? Yeah. Do you see an advantage with moderate to vigorous exercise, I use the word exercise, in terms of sitting types of exercise versus standing, or such as sitting on a recumbent bike and exercising vigorously, or rowing versus things that require standing? Is there a difference? Yeah, you know, I don't know completely the answer to that, but clearly, um, you know, there's postural differences there, clearly. Um, and, you know, at least for our patients who exercise kind of in a recumbent bike versus an upright bike, they report that they feel very different in those responses. But I think that that's a very important question. You know, part of it is, is if you like riding the recumbent bike better than the other bike, then by all means ride the recumbent bike. But if we're trying to get the best physiological response, the mode, of, the mode and the postural position is probably important. And, you know, and I've talked to Linda this morning about how in our motor pack study, this whole argument of, you know, we're doing bicycle testing and bicycle riding, but, you know, there's a lot of things that impact that, like local muscle fatigue and so on in people who are sedentary, whereas in the United States, most people walk. So maybe we need to be doing walking studies compared. So it's very important for us to understand those differences and how those differences may play into the responses that we're, that we're seeing that aren't just physiological but perceptual responses as well, in my mind. So. Anything else? Oh. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. It's very informative. Thank you. Uh, as a follow-up to Dr. Jeanette's question, I'm wondering if any controlled studies have been done with people in wheelchairs. Because people could exercise in wheelchairs for sure, depending upon their limitations. Yeah, I don't follow that literature quite as well. I do know that in the 2008 guidelines, there was a, there was a, a chapter in there, if I'm recalling, on uh, individuals with physical limitations such as wheel, wheelchair um, uh, bound individuals. I am very much aware of a group in Pittsburgh who um, is doing nothing but wheelchair-based research right now. And I'm not, I'm not following that as close as I need to, but it's a critically important piece because are those, where are the benefits and what kind of activity do we ben need to do in, in individuals like that? And then what are the health benefits? Because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of bad negative health outcomes that people are in you know, wheelchair bound. So I know the work's being done, I just haven't followed it quite as closely as I probably need to. Yeah. Uh, what are the devices that you use in many of your uh, studies? To it's, a, <laughs> it's evolved over time, in all honesty. So way back, way back, way back in the day, we used the Caltrack, which was the single accelerometer, which I don't even know if anybody has any of those anymore. Um, we 
for a long time, we're using uh, the body media sensor armband. Um, and we re really liked that because it gave us um, a number of outputs that were just beyond steps. It gave us intensity and time and all kinds of things. That company was sold to Jawbone a number of years ago, and then Jawbone went belly up. So that's not even available anymore. We have a bunch of them, but you know, at some point, they're all going to stop working. So, um, so we're kind of stuck, unfortunately, with things like you know, standard accelerometry. And I was talking to Rick Troyano from NIH just the other day about this. And you know, as much as that's everybody kind of hangs their hat on that, it's really not the perfect device. It's so limited. You know, you put it on the waist, it doesn't pick everything up. You put it on the wrist, it doesn't pick everything up. So I really feel like, and he and I were talking, that we really need, we really need a, an infusion of new devices or different devices for research. And what we really thought was, boy, some of the stuff that's commercially available is so far ahead of the research devices um, if we were willing to accept that some of those data might actually be okay. So we're still struggling with this just like everyone else, but you know, my opinion is, boy, if we, if we have devices that could give us something around step counts and some intensity factor, like maybe heart rate that's synchronized up, that would be probably <coughs> the best we could do at this point with the devices that are on the market. But that's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hi, nice seeing you. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, this, you know, this report mainly addresses sort of the amount and intensity of activity and what people should do. But I'm wondering, did it get into, or do you have any suggestions and recommendations about interventions, you know, what works, um, what about the environment? Um, did this report address any of that? Or, or if it didn't, what are your thoughts? Yeah, really good question. And I wish I had another hour to talk to you all. There was actually a, a new addition to this version, of at least the activity advisory report was an entire chapter on what we understand about intervention work all the way from individual level to technology to environmental and so on. And um, there's an entire chapter on that. And I would really, it's, it's too long to kind of get into. But it really was eye-opening to suggest, to look at and go, well, a lot of people say that this works. But when you look at the evidence, it doesn't quite work as well as we think. Or it has a very limited scope. And I think that that's an important chapter because we keep reinventing the same interventions over and over and over again with the hope that they're going to work differently the next time. And I think looking at that chapter would really help us to understand where have been the limitations of those prior interventions and how do we start to think kind of more uh, across, the, across the spectrum. Like how do, we, how do we handle that individual who we're treating on an individual basis but they have an environment in which they're functioning in. All that matters. So I would look at that chapter, but it did address that for sure. Thanks. All right, so I think we're at the end. I appreciate your time. Students, thank you all for coming. Thanks for the invitation, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all down the road. Appreciate it.